Amen. Mark chapter 16, we were we left off about verse 14, verses 14 through 20. Uh, Jesus has resurrected from the dead. That's the basic theme of Mark chapter 16. He has risen from the dead and he's appearing, he's making appearances to prove, to verify that he has indeed risen from the dead. And he did this so that they could bear witness to the fact of that resurrection. If Jesus had just resurrected from the dead and then went back to heaven, there would have been no witnesses. There would have been no verification of him rising from the dead. But you have these chosen special witnesses, which were the apostles. Acts chapter 1, they are charged to, to bear witness of Christ in Jerusalem, Judea, under Samaria, under the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, we don't bear witness to Christ. We teach and preach Jesus Christ. We can't bear witness because of why? We weren't witnesses. We have not seen Jesus with our eyes. There is a distinct difference in the New Testament between those who were eyewitnesses, who heard Him, who touched Him, who were there in His physical presence, and those who were not there but believed based on their testimony. So it's incorrect to say, I'm going to go witness for Jesus, and what people mean by that, they're going to go and evangelize. Uh, You cannot do that. Uh, You cannot bear witness to something you did not see or did not experience. Uh, But there were witnesses, not only the apostles, but uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul said that there were over how many at one time? 500 at one time that saw Jesus after he had resurrected from the dead. So there were more than just the twelve. And then you had Paul later on, Acts chapter 9. He saw the risen Lord on the road to Damascus when Christ appeared to him in glory and uh, changed things for Saul, who became the apostle Paul. And that qualified him to be a witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's making these appearances. Verse 14, Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because um, hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said unto them, after he rebukes them and tells them that they got a hard heart, rebukes them for their unbelief, Yet he's doing that to improve them so that they can be useful. That's that's what we learn from this right here. When someone is rebuked, it doesn't mean they cannot be useful for the Lord's cause. Because in the very next verse, he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So a rebuked person is rebuked to better them, to help them improve. It's constructive criticism. That's what rebuke is. And he's rebuking them, but he says, you're still useful if you're willing to do what's right. And that's what we have to understand, uh, that when, when rebuke comes our way, whether we receive the rebuke or we rebuke someone else for a certain behavior, we're not writing them off and saying that they're no longer useful, but there's certain things that they have to correct about themselves. And when we get the rebuke, there are certain things that we need to correct about ourself. So he had told them over and over again he was going to Jerusalem, they were going to kill him, and on the third day he was going to rise again. So he told them beforehand this was going to happen several times. The women came uh, bearing witness of the fact that he had risen from the dead, and they didn't believe. And so what you have is him uh, rebuking them for not believing, uh, even though they had plenty of evidence both his word and the words of those who saw the empty tomb. In verse 15, he gives what's called the the Great Commission. It's a condensed version of what you find in Matthew chapter 28. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, hold your place there and turn to Matthew's account. 
Matthew 28 and verse 18. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. You go make disciples of all nations. He's giving the Great Commission. You go, you preach, you teach, you make disciples by teaching them. Back to our text, Mark 16, verse 15. You go into all the world and you uh, preach the gospel to every creature. Every creature parallels what he was saying in chapter 28, all nations. In other words, the gospel is for all. It's for all people, no matter what their background. Jew, Gentile, it doesn't matter the color of the skin, it doesn't matter the language. It is for all people. There's a song that's, I think it's in our song books, but I've sung it in other places. The gospel is for all. Beautiful song that emphasizes the fact that we should be evangelistic on an international scale. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, there have been some who have said that this was given, this commission to go was given to the apostles and the apostles fulfilled it in the first century. There's various passages that say that and that it really doesn't apply to us in the 21st century. What is the reply to that? You mean by them, themselves? Right. Right. Exactly. The fact they couldn't do it themselves, just 12 people could only be at 12 different places at one time. I mean, that's, that's a very good point. They themselves could not do it. Well, who helped them? Mm-hmm. Acts 2. Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Talking about the persecution that came against the church at Jerusalem. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. They were preaching the gospel. So the very fact that the twelve could not themselves do this shows that it was not limited to them. Another thing is you have the fact that in every generation there's the problem of what? Sin. Every generation has that problem of sin. So every generation needs the gospel, needs the saving power of God, which is the gospel, to be preached to it. And the fact that Romans chapter 10 talks about the necessity of preaching the gospel. How shall they hear without a preacher? And Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. They've got to hear. They've got to have a preacher come and preach to them and, and preach this message. So it is something that was meant to be perpetual, even though it was initially given to the apostles. It was not limited to them. And yes, we are under the orders to go preach the gospel to every creature. I uh, use this example as well. Uh, the Lord's Supper, when it was instituted, was instituted to who? The apostles. the apostles. The apostles. But we know we're under obligation to partake of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Acts 20 and verse 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 tells us. So just because a, a, a command was given initially to the apostles... We know that it was passed down to the church, and we, if we're trying to be the church of the Bible, we're going to do what it, its mission is. And that mission is to evangelize. So go into all the world. Uh, that is a, a command for every disciple of every nation, of every generation, to go spread this gospel. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, to all nations. Now the response to that is uh, verse 16. He who believes and is baptized 
will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Now, there's a lot that's being said here that has explanation in other places. Now, the reason I say that is because some people say, well, if verse 15 and 16 still applies to us today, why doesn't verse 17 and 18 apply to us today? In fact, the Pentecostal denominations will say, yes, verse 15 through 18 applies to us today. And so they claim uh, the miraculous signs of speaking with new tongues and casting out demons and drinking things deadly and it won't hurt them. Uh, Taking up serpents. There is in the Appalachian Mountain areas some Pentecostal groups that you've probably seen in in, uh, uh, television specials that actually take up serpents. They'll bring serpents or well snakes into the assembly and they'll dance around with them dare them to to bite them and you know they get bit and they get hurt like everyone else they go to the hospital and die and they say well it was god's will that person die you know and they have an explanation to explain that Uh, we'll we'll talk about that in just a moment i'm kind of getting ahead of myself but the point is you have to handle a right or rightly divide the word of God and understand the instructions of Jesus, what continues in every generation and what doesn't. When we go back to uh, the preaching of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, there's a response to that. Verse 16. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Very simple to understand. The person who believes the gospel message and is baptized, that means immersed, shall be saved. That's the end result. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Now, keep your place here. Go to Matthew chapter 28. Let's go to the parallel passage on the Great Commission. Matthew 28, verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Preach the word to all creatures. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. The saved of of Mark 16, 16 parallels being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What Jesus is saying here when he says in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, he's not saying here's what you are supposed to say when you baptize someone. It's saying here's what you're supposed to do. In there, in verse 19, in the name, that word in could probably be better translated into. That's what the word in Greek is. It is the little Greek preposition that means into. And what Jesus is saying here is when you're baptized, you enter into the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's the concept of now, they, the Godhead, owns you now. You're a part of God's family. When an ancient person would purchase an individual, purchase a slave, that person was purchased into that family and when that happened they became a part of the family and uh, that process is the same concept that Jesus is talking here when you obey the gospel and you're baptized you're baptized into Christ that's what other passages say Galatians 3 27 you're baptized into the name of the Father Son and Holy Spirit you're now a part of God's family So that concept there of being saved parallels that, again, emphasizing the fact that, yes, baptism is necessary uh, for salvation. Now, back to uh, Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. 
Notice what it does not say. And when you notice what it doesn't say, that eliminates a lot of confusion. It does not say he who believes is saved and will be baptized. That's what a lot of denominational people say. It does not say he who is baptized will believe and be saved. Again, that's what a lot of denominations say because they say you baptize a baby and then it grows up and develops faith later on in life. But the process is you've got to believe the gospel. You preach the gospel, you believe that gospel, and you are baptized, you will be saved. Saved is the concept of being rescued. Jesus is the Savior. And he says, here's how I will save you. When you believe my gospel and you're baptized. Yes. Right. Exactly. It doesn't say he who believes is saved. Yeah, exactly. And so you have Jesus giving this very simple, very simple statement. And so many people have fought against this. But it harmonizes with other passages perfectly concerning the end result of the person believing and being baptized. What is the end result? And you have that connection of and. You believe and you're baptized. What's the result? Shall be saved. Well, Acts 2. Acts 2 and verse 38. Peter says the same thing Jesus does, but he just uses different words. Acts 2 and verse 38, the day the church began. Peter said, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Forgiveness of sins goes with saved. Acts 22 and verse 16. When Saul talks about his own baptism. Acts 22 and verse 16. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That goes along with what Jesus said. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Saved goes along with and wash away your sins. So that goes along with that concept. The end result of of baptism is the washing away of sins by the blood of Christ. Um, Many others we could look at. Let's look at... uh, Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6 talks about being buried with him, verse 4, through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so now you should walk in newness of life, newness of life saved. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. This is just different ways of saying the same thing that Jesus said the end result of baptism is uh, being saved of course you have um, also Galatians 3 Galatians 3 and verse 27 for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ saved You're baptized into Christ. You're now in Christ. You put on Christ. You're saved. So again, the end result of baptism is salvation. You could go to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. And verse 21. There is also an antitype which now saves us baptism not the removal of the filth of the flesh but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ saved there's the end result and Peter says baptism is what now saves us because it's the point at which we are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ now when you point all this out to people people say well then you must not believe in the blood of Jesus Christ you, you're rejecting the blood for water. You're substituting the blood of Jesus for water. You're always talking about water, being baptized. How do you answer that? Because that's an accusation you'll, you'll find. Right. 
But is it baptism versus the blood? That's, that's basically the answer. It's not baptism versus the blood of Christ. That's how you benefit from the blood of Christ. Exactly. Ephesians 1.3. And you get into Christ through baptism. That's being saved. So they, they'll make it to where you, they, they're making you say or they're misrepresenting you by saying that it's baptism versus the blood of Christ. That's what, that's what they'll say you're saying. That's not at all what we're saying. That's a misrepresentation of what we're saying. First John uh, mm-hmm. Right. It's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us. Also, that's a good verse, and also Revelation 1:5, uh, as, as John is writing to Christians, he says, "You're washed in the blood uh, of Jesus Christ, cleansed by His blood." And so, um, but here's what people will do. They'll go to those verses like that you just mentioned and Revelation 1.5 and say, see, there's no baptism there. It says the blood. But see, that's not how you handle the Word of God. You put them together. First of all, who's he talking to? He's talking to people who's already been baptized. They're Christians. So it's not baptism versus the blood. How do you access the blood? How do you get into the benefit of Jesus' death? Well, Romans 6 tells us you're baptized into His death. That's where He shed His blood. So yes, it is the blood that cleanses, but the question is when. When does that happen? And it happens in the water. Not by the water, in the water. We're cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We're saved in the water of baptism. And the water of baptism does not cleanse us, but that's the place that it takes place when we, by faith, obey that command. That's what Peter was talking about in 1 Peter 3.21 when he says, not the removal of the filth of the flesh. It's not the outer cleansing of the water that does it. But it's the blood of Jesus that cleanses and saves us. So it's not baptism versus the blood of Christ. They go together. It's all part of the equation. God has done His part in sending His Son. God done everything, has done everything He's going to do to provide salvation. We access it by obeying the plan of salvation He's given. Our part is obedient faith. Now, here's another one that that, uh, verse 16 uh, brings about sometimes in people's minds. It says, uh, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but it says, but he who does not believe will be condemned. It does not say, he who does not believe and is not baptized will be condemned. John 3. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's a very good answer to that. You're condemned already if you don't believe. A person who does not believe, they're not going to, be, they're not going to obey the command. And if they did, it wouldn't do them any good anyway. They'd just be getting wet. They just be being dipped in water. So he's saying, look, if you don't even have faith to begin with, you're condemned. You're going to be lost. And so he doesn't have to mention and is not baptized because he told us who's going to be saved. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He's already told us who's going to be saved in the sentence. But if you don't believe, you'll be condemned. Because belief is the beginning point of the process. You don't even have that in place, you're already condemned. Let me give you a parallel statement that I think really answers this. 
He who eats and digests shall live, but he who does not eat shall die. I don't have to say and does not digest because if you don't eat, you're not going to digest. You see? You don't eat to begin with. I don't have to say and does not digest. It's understood there that if you didn't even begin the process, you're going to die. But he who eats and digests shall live. So these are various arguments that people will bring up to try to get around the plain passage. It takes help to misunderstand that, and there's a lot of people who will go to great lengths to help you misunderstand this. Because, why? Their theology says you're saved by faith alone. And if this verse is true, then their theology is wrong, dead wrong. So they have to try to explain it away. Others will even try to say, well, this is not water here and baptized. This is spirit baptism. This is a, it has nothing to do with water. Well, that doesn't work either because of what Jesus said in John 3 and verse 5. You must be born of water and the spirit to enter the kingdom of God. Again, entering the kingdom of God is equivalent to being saved. It's another way of saying being saved. So there, there's a lot of arguments against verse 16, but they do not hold up. Um, if you know how to go to other verses and how to, to answer them, um, the, the verse is so plain. Let me tell you how plain it is. I was studying, and Matt was with me, with a, a, a lady that has no religious background at all. She's basically agnostic. And she was studying with us, and we were looking at some passages to, to help out her brother understand the importance of baptism. And when she read this verse, she said to her brother, this means if you're not baptized, you can't go to heaven. That's probably the first time she's ever read that verse in her life. And she understood what it meant. I didn't have to explain it to her. You remember that? That was the conclusion she came to in her mind just by reading the verse. You've got to be baptized if you want to go to heaven. Well, that's exactly what we're saying. And uh, that does away with uh, the false concepts that are out there uh, that say you don't have to be baptized to be saved. You're saved first, and then you're baptized later on as the, the Baptist and, and other denominations teach that's just simply not the case any questions or comments before we go any further verse 17 and 18 and connects what he says in verse 16 and these signs will follow those who believe in my name that means by the authority of Christ, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and, and they will recover. Now, some have drawn an erroneous conclusion by saying, if you're going to say verse 16 applies to, the, to today, then verse 17 and 18 must apply to today today as well but here's the problem verse 17 and 18 is expanded on and explained in other passages as to what is going on basically what you have in verse 17 and 18 is the miraculous activity of the apostles laid out for us in the book of acts that's exactly what the the apostles did and those on whom the apostles laid their hands gave them this power, gave them this ability to, to do these things. So the book of Acts is summarized in verse 17 and 18 concerning the miraculous power uh, that would be at work in the early church to confirm the word to people who didn't have a written New Testament like we do. And so verse uh, 17 and 18 uh, is talking about those miraculous activities. 
you, you just follow what the, the book of Acts says. In Acts chapter 1, he's giving final instructions to the apostles, telling them to wait in Jerusalem till you're endued with power from on high. You're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, that happens to the 12 apostles. Matthias took Judas's place. So you have the 12 apostles endowed with the power that's being described here in verse 17 and 18. You go to Acts chapter 6, what do you find? They laid hands on certain individuals. Now those individuals have that power. You go to Acts chapter 8, you find that it's spelled out through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit is given. The ability, the power um, that is described here in verse 17 and 18 is is, uh, given in that way. Well, we are told also in the New Testament that these activities have a duration. They have a shelf life. They're going to come to an end. Baptism for the forgiveness of sins, baptism to be saved, is going to be to the end of the world. The reason why I know that is because of Matthew chapter 28. Jesus said, Lo, I'll be with you even to the end of the world. But we know that this activity of the miraculous powers uh, has a shelf life and an expiration. And we know that because of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Those spiritual gifts would come to an end when that which is perfect has come. The perfect is referring to the complete revelation of God's will. We have that in our completed New Testament. No need for those miracles to, to keep going. No need to, to be perpetuated. When people think they're more spiritual because they have miracles, which they don't, by the way. They think they do, but they don't. And they think that, well, these spiritual gifts will make you more spiritual. You need to read 1 Corinthians. They were the most ungodly people that you could come across, and they had spiritual gifts. And Paul had to rebuke them for their behavior. So it doesn't make you more spiritual. He had to rebuke them for their mishandling of those spiritual gifts as well. In chapters uh, um, 12 through 14 of 1 Corinthians. So the miraculous activity you you see here in verse 17 and 18 is not for everyone who believes there. When it says in verse 17, these signs will follow... Those who believe, well, you go into the New Testament and you find out who specifically he's talking about. The apostles and those on whom the apostles laid their hands. Now, when none of that works as far as trying to convince someone the miraculous doesn't happen today, the next thing is to say, okay, show me. That is not wrong, that is not improper to ask for the evidence. If you claim to have the power, then you should be able to do it. And uh, there have been good brethren throughout the years who have challenged these people in debates to heal the sick. I was at a debate one time where there were people in the audience that were physically infirmed. I think there was a blind man and a person in a wheelchair. And the brother who was debating the Pentecostal said, here is your chance to end this debate right now. Heal these individuals. Of course he didn't. And he came up with the excuse, which is basically the excuse that's been passed on since the Pentecostal movement began. You don't have enough faith. That's the Pentecostal excuse to get out of having to heal somebody. To prove that they have what they claim to have. And so... I have personally challenged these uh, individuals who claim miracles to heal. They, they won't do it. And, um, and that's exactly what the Bible tells us to do. Test them. 1 John 4, 1, put them to the test. So they, they don't have the power that they claim they have. Plus, they have redefined the word miracle to mean just about anything that's extraordinary. And so... Oh, the sun came up. That's a miracle. So they, that's why they say miracles happen every day. The sun came up and the blue jays chirped. That's a miracle. No, that's not a miracle. That's natural. God created that miraculously thousands of years ago. Yes, it's wondrous. Yes, it's glorious. But it's not a miracle according to the biblical definition. 
So when they redefine miracle, they can mean anything they want when it comes to it, to miracle. Well, these signs followed the apostles. They cast out demons. We read about that in the book of Acts. They spoke in new languages, new tongues. Acts chapter 2, you have the example of that on the day of Pentecost. They took up serpents. The only occasion that we have an example of that is the apostle Paul on the island of Malta. And it was an accidental thing. He was building a fire and a snake came out and latched onto his arm and it bit him. And um, the islanders said, well, he must be cursed because this snake bit him. And then when he didn't get sick, they said, well, he must be a god because he didn't get sick. And so it gave him an opportunity to preach to them. This is the only recorded incident of, of the taking up of serpents there in, ver, the, in the book of Acts that, I, that I'm aware of. And it wasn't something Paul was seeking to do to, to dare the snake to bite him. It was an accidental type of thing. It was just something that happened. And then the uh, drink anything deadly will by no means hurt them. I don't know of any record of that in the book of Acts. Of course, the book of Acts doesn't record everything for us. It records what we need to know about the early church, but not everything. So I'm sure that this may refer to uh, people who uh, were probably poisoned by the officials who hated the church. And so they would poison their food, and sure enough, they would survive process of being poisoned that would be a miraculous sign and then of course the lay hands on the sick and they will recover do we see that in the book of acts sure miracles signs and wonders being performed by the apostles uh, the apostle paul laying hands on the sick and healing them all of this was for a purpose verse 20 well, let's go ahead and read verse 19 and 20 and we'll see the purpose of the miracles so then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven, sat down at the right hand of God. That's the ascension of Christ there in verse 19, verse 20. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. So that's the purpose of the signs, to confirm they were actually from God. That they were the genuine article. It was God's stamp of approval. This person is from God. Now we have the Bible to do that today. We have the completed revelation of God to verify that, that this is God's will uh, in the written form, a permanent written form. But they had the miracles of the apostles and the early disciples to do that. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. In verse 2. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, as Jesus, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Verse 4, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. God was bearing witness to them that they were his actual people, his actual spokesmen. And so you have that verification there uh, of, of the fact that the, they were from God because when the church began in the, in the first century, in Acts chapter 2 uh, has recorded for us, the day of Pentecost, there was no written New Testament. They were the New Testament. Their message verbally speaking and their preaching and teaching, that was the New Testament. Then over the process of time, the 27 books would be written down and given to us in a permanent form. So as, as we sum up the book of Mark, as we come to this conclusion of this book, very powerful book, it is the shortest of uh, the gospel accounts because, remember your introduction, what does it emphasize about Jesus? 
and emphasizes something about Jesus more than the others. His actions, right? His activity. The word immediately or straightway, depending on the translation that you have, is is uh, an indicator that this is a book of action. And so the, the activity of Jesus in this book is emphasized more than the other accounts, even though we do come across some teachings uh, in the book of Mark. Also, um, the fact that he is the servant. He is the great servant of the people. That's emphasized very much in the book of Mark. Mark, it is believed to have been written to a Roman mindset. The Romans were very interested in action over words. Force, power, that meant more to them. Show me, don't tell me, show me. And so Mark emphasizes the actions of Jesus over his teachings uh, to this uh, audience that he's writing to. And so the, the activity of, of Jesus is very much stressed in, in the book of Mark. Not a whole lot of references to Old Testament prophecy because, of course, the Romans wouldn't be concerned with that. They were not very familiar with the Old Testament scriptures that they thought belonged to the Jews. And uh, in the book of Matthew, of course, you find a lot of quotes from the Old Testament. This, was, this happened or this was done that it might be fulfilled, and it gives an explanation. It gives a quotation from a prophet. Because Matthew was written to what kind of audience? To the Jews. And Luke was written to what kind of audience? Greeks. And so Luke emphasizes the humanity of Jesus. The humanity of Jesus. And then John was a book that emphasizes what? The deity, the deity of Jesus. It was written uh, much later in the first century than the other books and very much emphasizes the deity of Jesus and the fact that he came in the flesh. Like I said, next week uh, is singing. I'm not sure where we're going to go in in, uh, our uh, class. Uh, If you have any suggestion, let me know.